So what a pleasant way to end National Women's History Month with a Power Woman panel. So uh, I would love uh, to start out the panel if you each could uh, give us an overview of your work and a background. Ruth, let's start with you. Um, my name is Ruth Stanislaus. I'm the founding principal of PS971, which is located in uh, Bay Ridge Sunset Park. Um, in Brooklyn, we're a K-5 school. Um, I founded the school, wrote the proposal, and it was accepted. Uh, this is my ninth year being principal, 27 years in education. Um, and so just a little bit about my background with eating healthy and plant-based foods. Um, we are one of four vegetarian schools in the city. In fact, there's only four in the city. <laughs> Um, and we recently became vegetarian um, about two years ago. When I first opened the school, uh, I knew that we wanted to um, focus on healthy living. Our school is called Math, Science, and Healthy Living. Um, and so we took a whole child approach um, to not only look at students academically, um, socially, and emotionally, but physically and nutritionally also. Um, so we started off with an alternate menu, which the Department of Education um, provides for everybody, which uh, has some plant-based meals, but there's also a little bit of meat. And then about two years ago, um, under the guidance of the Coalition for um, Healthy School Foods, uh, we worked with them a lot. We decided to go full vegetarian, um, and that's where we are now. That's awesome. Go for it. Hi, I'm Leanna Levine Reisner. I am a mom of three kids, and my health story involves reversing endometriosis with a whole food plant-based diet. Um, and I was really spurred into this by my own family's need for health. And once I started getting into the literature and learning more about it, I realized there was a whole movement out there behind this kind of message. And so um, I decided to take on leadership within Manhattan to try to bring awareness and support to people about whole food plant-based nutrition. And there were some other lovely people working in the Bronx, in Queens, in Staten Island, Long Island, who were doing the same. And just earlier this month, we relaunched all together, sort of under the same brand as Plant Powered Metro New York. And our vision is to take the movement that's already begun internationally and especially nationally, and to give it more fuel. So we have folks on the ground who are our messengers, if you will, who have been personally changed by plant-based nutrition and are trying to connect in whatever ways we can with local communities to bring this message out in many different ways. So Ruth, and <laughs> so Ruth, I'll start with you. You say we're one of four vegetarian schools as if it might have been easy to become a vegetarian school, but I'm sure there were barriers to that institutional change. Can you go over what some of the barriers were? Was there anything cost-wise, parents? Um, um, coming from the cost-wise aspect, you know, we're a public school, so there's nothing um, that impacts our school from a, a budgetary um, um, aspect. Um, but because the, the Department of Education, the Office of um, School Foods and Nutrition, they take care of us. So kids in public school, they eat free. They have free breakfast. They have free lunch. Um, but one of the barriers that we really had to overcome was our demographics and then looking at what do kids eat when they go home to their families and just in the community in general? So my school is located in a community where I have 55% Asian um, Pacific Islander students, um, mainly from China, and 39% Latino students um, from Mexico and Ecuador and many Latin countries. And so one of the barriers was really looking at the staples in the home of, you know, of the kids that come from the community like that. So in our Chinese community, they're very heavy into pork. Um, and in our Latin community, they're very heavy into meat. So when we approach the parents, um, we, we ask them, you know, what do you think about plant-based foods? And so many parents were like, oh no, our kids need meat because of the protein. Um, so then it was really up to us to do a lot of the research so that we can show parents. Um, we can show them, look at the statistics. So that basically meant having meetings with parents, going to our PTA, um, 
We have family night dinners where we have staff members that actually cook for our parents. It's sort of like a, um, a, a like chopped type of show, but the parents are actually cooking. Um, we have, um, we've connected with um, our Brooklyn Borough President, um, Eric Adams' office. He's uh, come in and he's spoken to our staff members. Um, and we've linked up with the Coalition for Healthy School Foods. They actually come in and do lessons for our students twice a week um, about plant-based foods. We show our students what it looks like before it's cooked. Um, and then at lunchtime, they'll actually see it on the menu. So we do all of this with the hopes that when the kids go home, they can actually talk to their parents about some of the foods that they've been eating all day. Um, and then their parents will question them and say, okay, how'd it taste? Um, so it was just really the barriers was just trying to get through to the parents, but through the students um, and through meetings and just different things like that, we were able to get through to them. And you said it's been, uh, you've been vegetarian for two years now. Yeah. Was it difficult, how much more difficult was it year one versus year two, or did you have the same sort of obstacles year two? Um, I mean, I don't, I didn't really view them as obstacles. I just viewed them as, okay, you need to know the information. And so to me, the best way to, to get people to know about different things is to provide them with the information. Because you can't just assume that, you know, oh, look, I'm vegetarian, don't you wanna be? Because the, the first question that they'll have is, well, why should I be vegetarian? What is it doing for me? So once we just started providing with them with statistics um, about childhood obesity, um, about early onset of heart disease in children, which they really didn't know about, and about the benefits of plant-based foods, then they were more open to it because who doesn't want their kids to be healthy? So th we, we kind of took, you know, took it from that way to say, you know, you want your kids to be healthy. Like, it's not just an academic um, piece here in school. It's they're here and they have two out of three meals with us. And so this is how we're providing the healthy foods for them. Don't you want to try this at home? And I know students have, students and children have a role to play in your theory of change as plant-powered met Metro New York. Um, can you elaborate on what y'all's theory of change looks like? Sure, so I know that Daniel was mentioning this about the idea behind psychology is very theory-based. And um, I think it's also really important in the nonprofit world when you're trying to create a change out in the world that you have a theory of change and you understand what you're trying to get at. So for us, um, going back to your question about should we inspire people with the, some of the fear, um, my training is in organizational psychology uh, and positive psychology. And so I like to start from a place of opportunity and appreciation because there is an incredibly positive message about the power of plant-based nutrition. And if we bring it to people and meet them where they are with that message, um, it actually has the capacity to sort of open, open the brain. Um, and there's been research on, on um, the brain and on behavior that shows that this is the be a better way of approaching people and helping them to make changes. Um, but to really get to it, first of all, you need to talk about who are, who are we going to. Well, we need to find people who are open to change. Some of those people are people who are already hurting. They're sick. They're tired of where they are. They don't trust their doctors anymore. Um, they might be really stuck. Other people are caring for people. For me, it was caring for my kids and worrying about their health. For other people, you're caring for your parents. Um, all of these situations put us in a prime position to be open to the idea that there is something different than what mainstream medicine is telling us. Um, and then the theory goes into, well, what are you, what are you gonna do to get people to actually think about changing their habits? Um, first, I think, is using stories. Um, when we hear the story of the Brooklyn Borough President, we all say, oh my God. <laughs> um, if I were to sit here and tell you a little bit more about mine, if my friend Enrica would tell you her story of healing from colitis, et cetera, et cetera, we would all be in a room full of, um, of motivation because that's where it comes from, these narratives. The science will tell us a lot, but it doesn't tell us quite as much as the stories do. So the repeated exposure to stories, I think, is a key piece of our theory of change. Um, the second piece is trusting relationships. Um, we have to have a relationship with somebody who has made a change in order to even see the possibility for ourselves sometimes, or to trust in the people who are giving the message to us. And right now, it's not easy to trust people who are telling you this diet or that diet. 
Um, so getting through to that trust is important, and I think that's the role that our empowered leaders sh can have in community. If somebody's out there trying to talk to a church or talk to a school about the power of plant-based nutrition and why it will be effective in those communities, um, we're talking about building trust first and then creating supportive relationships as the next step for when people are ready to change their diets. And then the third piece of the theory is around um, providing sufficient instruction for people so that they feel that the change is achievable. Um, in a way, this is the rewiring of the synapses that the Brooklyn Borough President was talking about. We have to show them that it's possible and that you can relearn behaviors. And uh, Ruth, I kind of diving a little bit into the institution of DOE, what is your relationship with the Office of School Food? What is, uh, how does one become a vegetarian school? I mean, do you have to do a survey? Do you have to send home letters to parents? How does that process look? Um, well, it's the Department of Ed, so within the Department of Ed, there are a lot of things that are already set in place, but there are four of us. Well, there were three of us before I joined. And so just knowing that there, were, there was at least one school out there, there happens to be three, um, was a little, made it a little bit easier because then you know, I said, okay, well, I'm not going to be the only one. Um, and so then it was a matter of just connecting with the Office of School Foods, um, which is in Long Island City, and trying to set up meetings where they would actually come to my school and see what we have here and see who our kids are. Um, and then sort of working with them, holding them accountable, but working with them with the vision that we had. Um, and then also pulling in the other schools to say, look, there are four of us here. This could be a growing movement here. And then once we connected with the borough president's office, you know, it was like a go because he, um, he's focusing on Meatless Mondays, which the Department of Ed is now um, adopting as a you know, part of a, the school food system that all school, schools may be, have meatless Mondays now. So in our eyes, we're sort of a little ways there, but we just chose to go the full way. Um, but working with the Department of Ed, we, we get support from them. Um, you know, we've been working on looking at various menus. Like my students went on a field trip to Long Island City to do a taste testing. Um, to see, okay, can we have another menu item on our menu? Um, it's a little difficult because with the Office of um, Food and Nutrition, you really have to deal with the finance part um, that we don't really participate in. But as we know, to eat well, it costs, right? So yeah, it also costs in the Department of Education too. Um, so sometimes that's a little barrier, but you know, it's a slow progress, but it's progress. So that's how we're sort of looking at our relationship with the Department of Ed, like we're making baby steps with them. And so to speak to the allies portion, I know your group has had a lot of success gaining allies. And your group started, what, a year ago-ish? In Manhattan, yeah. And now you all are just dynamite. You're everywhere, and it's amazing. Uh, so how have you built up allies? Who have some of those allies been? Sure. So I, the way that we operate is as a network. So our idea is that there are people all over the metro area who know about this information. And if we can connect everybody and give them strength and a common brand and a unified message, then we will have more credibility in the field for folks to see us and say, oh, maybe I should consider that when I'm thinking about my health. So that's one piece of it. Um, the, in, in our base building work that has been going on over the past year and more, or more, for um, we have organizers in the Bronx and Long Island that have been around for longer, um, a lot of this is about uh, building the relationships and then elevating new leaders. And so um, we try to give people a role at, by saying, look, we are all connected to institutions that have the possibility of changing with our intervention. So what can we do to provide support to these people um, so that they feel that they have um, you know, the backing to go in and, and offer a different solution to their institution? Um, for me, I, you know, I'm in the Upper West Side. I decided to go to the wellness center in my neighborhood, which is a JCC, a Jewish community center. And I knocked on the door of the senior director of health and wellness programming and said, could you do some plant-based programming? And after some conversations where I wasn't sure if it was going anywhere, we ended up creating a whole series of plant-based um, educational programs that began just this past January and are continuing 
for as many months as, as, uh, as they want. They're really very interested. And it also led to us creating our own Jumpstart program at the JCC in February, where we got a group of 21 people together to do a deep dive immersion into whole food plant-based nutrition with the before and after biometrics, like the kind that Dr. Ponyman was talking about. So that just happened by one person knocking on the door of somebody with influence in an institution. My friend Enrica went to a church in her neighborhood in Astoria and found, after talking to three other churches, finally found a, a, a priest who was interested in hearing her message and was able to go and speak to the seniors there at their weekly meeting and now will have more of a presence there as the months go on uh, because people are genuinely interested in this topic. We have someone out in the Bronx who um, found a dietitian at the ShopRite in his neighborhood who knew about plant-based nutrition but hadn't really done anything with it in her work. And by going and encouraging her to do something, now she does monthly whole food plant-based food demonstrations. And then she also has created a flyer for shoppers so that they can find whole food plant-based um, uh, ingredients and supplies in the store. Um, and then on the government level, uh, showing up, being present, um, testifying when there's opportunities to comment on banning processed meats in schools, or um, uh, down in Staten Island, uh, one of the organizers, Natasha, she has been sitting at the table with their uh, government leadership and their bor uh, borough president trying to get this on the agenda. And having more people getting this on the agenda is what this movement is all about. And that's a very uh, cool shout out because I believe we have a contingent of four people from the Staten Island Borough President's Office here. So uh, very exciting that yes, being at the table and showing up definitely uh, begins that conversation. So I know we have a lot of different people in this audience who are coming from a lot of different sectors. We've got some folks from YMCA, I know some Seventh-day Adventists, we've got Department of Health, Department of Education. If you were to give kind of a broad sweeping advice to how does one move the needle within their institution? What would you say? So if you were to have one or two minute pitch about that, and Leanna, let's start with you. Sure, um, there's a lot I could say here. So um, one is if you need support, Plant Powered Metro New York is here for you. Um, I think we all need to know that we're not acting as individuals, we are part of a broader movement. And when you have that support, and sometimes the brand, and maybe even an expert in the room next to you when you're going and talking to somebody, uh, that's the kind of role that we would hope to play to help people take an action rather than feel scared about taking an action. Um, the second is to have your talking points and materials, things that you can share that sh show the evidence. I love the SUNY Downstate materials because they're really solid, scientifically based. Um, materials that people can take for, the, for those who need it. Some communities really want the evidence, others just want the stories, and it really depends on so the demographic that you're working with. Um, the other thing is to find a partner and not to do it alone. When you have a bunch of parents or a bunch of teachers or a school principal who are interested in this and you can bring those people together, that's so much better than just being your own individual person. Um, and I think also um, knowing what your next steps are, being able to plan out, okay, if I do this, what, do I, what am I really asking for when I go to a leader? And how am I going to follow up with them? What do I have the time for? And, and where is uh, this person's motivation and interest? And how can I follow them where they are? And I think just to add on to um, what you were saying before, you know, coming from a public school setting is to really find out how can we uh, more or less take the interests of our students because they are the ones that will actually spread the word without any questions. <laughs> so when they go home to parents, you know, they are the ones that, again, that will insist on, no, I want to eat this and I want to eat that. Um, and just connecting with their parents. Um, so if you're in a public school, there are four of us, and you're welcome to come and visit me anytime <laughs> to see how we do it. Wonderful. Thank you both so much. Um, <laughs> We have time for uh, about five questions. So anyone in the audience, if you raise your hand. Ginny, let's start with you. And if we're having problems with mics. Yeah, you can speak loudly. Go for it. She's a great advocate. And thank you for that uh, wonderful panel. I appreciate it. This question is actually for Ruth. Um, Rachel knows I do a lot of work with schools. Um, I think that's wonderful. I mean, absolutely amazing that you've been able to go uh, vegetarian. Uh, my question to you is, um, have you seen any 
a um, reduction in the number of children that access perhaps the lunch program, or is it more? And then the other thing is that have you seen any difference in academics or behavior or any other changes in the school environment as far as the children once you went, went vegetarian? Um, I mean, just really going, focusing on our data, like w this is just our second year in, so you know, looking at our data, we wanted to give it a little bit more time um, to actually see the change. We did, we did um, grow in our ELA and, and math state scores since last year. Um, I don't know if that's you know, because of the food that all the kids are eating, now eating. Um, but I think what we're doing is we have a, a three to five year plan to just quick, uh, keep collecting data. Um, our numbers of students that eat school foods did not fall off. Um, and just really you know, keep collecting our data for uh, the next couple of years and then we'll be able to look at the trends um, and compare it to academics. Are you growing some of your food that you're incorporating into the? Um, yeah, we're actually a sustainability school. We're a green school, so we, we do all of that. We have um, a green team um, that goes around and, and we recycle and they go around and check all the classrooms. We have a garden outside in our schoolyard that we work with um, our science teacher. Um, we're a sustainability school, which means that we look at composting, um, we look at growing healthy foods, we look at um, um, how we can keep the environment green so our school is healthy living. So a lot of the things that we do in the building really zoom into that. Um, so everything sort of falls into you know one whole thing of who are we going to be in 10 years as humans in this world and how can we change right now so that when we get there, we can actually change the world. Thank you, I'd love to visit. I'm gonna come with Rachel. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Can speak loud and I can repeat the question. Uh, Leanna, uh, you spoke about the power of story. Uh, I know you have a Facebook page. Uh, Thank you. Uh, so, a place where people could post their stories. Uh, when we have events at Long, in Long Island, you have maybe one or two people who will speak to an audience. But with the website, with the Facebook page, uh, you have an opportunity for a lot more people to contribute their, their stories. Mm -hmm. And do you have anything that you're creating that is like that? Yeah, not formally right now. There is actually a wonderful, so you know the national organization Forks Over Knives that's behind the movie, um, they put out these testimonials on a periodic basis of people who have made really dramatic improvements when adopting a whole food plant-based diet. And the stories that they've collected are really incredible. Um, what I would love to do is to have more of our members be able to sh feel open to sharing their stories through social media. And it would be great to create some kind of social media campaign around that. Thank you. Yes. Hi, I'm curious to know, uh, for those parents who are between the ages of approximately, I guess in high school, up to 30, how receptive are they to plant-based eating for their kids? Um, repeat, sorry, repeat the question? So in between, for parents who are between the ages of approximately, I guess starting from like high school up until 30, um, how receptive have you guys seen um, their kids be to plant-based eating? Is that too? Oh, uh, I'm t I really uh, That's for, for both how, of like, how, any how of you guys. How receptive have you seen parents be to their kids? So, for instance, if their kid goes vegetarian and ve right. or vegan? Right, correct. Um, I mean, my school goes from K to 5, so, mm -hmm. you know, my older students are 10 and 11. Um, I think the parents are very, very receptive um, to what, they, what their uh, children are eating because, um, you know, if it's healthy, I don't know a parent that wouldn't want their child to eat healthy. Um, I think sometimes we sort of fall into um, the realm of the kids not necessarily liking the food. Um, and so my next step as a school is to uh, really try to connect with the Office of Food and Nutrition to talk about what are the actual 
um, items on the menu that you can sort of draw kids into. Um, we're really competing with McDonald's and Burger King and places like that, but then my idea is, well, um, you know, kids are visual. Why couldn't we have veggie burgers and veggie nuggets? Because they, they just look at it and they'll say, oh, wow, we got nuggets, but they're not really saying, okay, well, what is this nugget made out of? You know, so that they just know that we have nuggets. So. As a school, my next step then is to really try to zoom in on how can we change some of the items that we have um, on the menu. The items that we have on the menu, I mean, I love them as an, as, as an adult. You know, we have black bean quesadillas, we have um, um, zucchini, we have um, um, bean tacos, you know, delicious. But then I'm not a fourth grader, you know, that just spent the weekend at McDonald's with their parents. But, so I think um, our next step is to look at the items. I'll also say, I speak mostly from my own experience. In our, in our group, in the base building work that we've done so far, I have not found so many parents who are aware of and actively implementing a whole food plant-based diet with their children. And the ones who I have found are struggling with it because, gosh, our society makes it so hard. Um, and so when I'm thinking about my experience with um, you know, my kids who are all, they're age eight and younger, um, I've, I'm in the Jewish community. And in the Jewish community, there's definitely, a, uh, the omnivorous diet is, is the default, but there are plenty of vegetarians. And I think um, most of the time I don't hear anybody talking about um, what kind of diet is the healthiest diet. People just are sort of going with the mainstream recommendations on food. Um, I would, I, but every parent says they want their kid to eat healthy, but at some point they throw up their hands. Once they're past the toddler phase and the kids sort of are more in the, in the driver's seat, um, it's a lot harder to control what your children eat. And unless you create the safe haven in your home, it's nearly impossible. So I think one of the things that we would like to do if we can get through to parents is to be able to say, look, you are in control of what's in your home. And if you can do this, then your children can do this. And we have to be partners to create healthy children because they're the ones who are going to suffer the most and who are already suffering the most, as Dr. Katz showed, by sort of generational trauma that's been um, passed to us from decades of poor eating. And to uh, elaborate on something that's happening locally, the New York City Healthy School Food Alliance is a parent-led organization. It's kind of a grassroots movement right now that has teamed up with Borough Hall as well as uh, with other educators. And they are having, they're hosting a rally in March around healthy eating sometime in June. So definitely try and uh, Google the NYC Healthy School Food Alliance. Definitely someone to have on your radar. And to your point of, of how do we maybe switch out some of these products. I was just alerted yesterday that there is a pilot project, very exciting pilot project going on in a hospital system down in Florida, about 11 chain hospitals, um, who have switched out all of their meat products for the vegetarian alternative. And they're doing a pilot right now. There'll probably be some groundbreaking news in this world if, if it is successful and if they sign that contract. Um, but it's exciting to see some of these alternatives really give right. birth. Well, we've already begun with the meatless Mondays, yeah. so that's the first, mm -hmm. that's the first step. So. And we have time for one last question, so in the back. Hi, I'm a culinary um, educator, and I have a few, um, I guess, answers or comments. For the high school, someone asked about the parents being receptive when they're in high school. Um, for me, I've noticed when you teach the high school students mm -hmm. about food, their parents are the ones that are then putting these items that you're showing them about on their, their menus or going to the supermarket. It then becomes a family activity. For someone else, a while ago you asked about um, in food deserts, providing food, although we have the food carts. What I've done with the school that I work in, I actually reached out to the farmer's market. I turned it into a day. So in between the time that you would drop your child off or pick them up, the farm stand would be available for you. So a part of your day, dropping off your child, then turns that into dinner or lunch or a learning experience. And they lack awareness in food education. That's what we're here for. Mm -hmm. So I, these are just, um, I guess, comments or solutions. <laughs> so with that, do you all have any closing comments? Um, I mean, I know that uh, I just want everyone to know that the work is always going to be hard, you know, until it becomes 
systematic um, within our environment, within our communities that uh, more or less like the table will flip where you'll see instead of McDonald's and Burger King, you'll see the healthy places and not many Burger Kings and McDonald's left. And then everyone, um, everyone will, it would be an automatic to just eat healthy. So, um, but it's a slow process to get there. And so we just really have to look at the small inroads that we're making every day. So in my school, it's when kids come in and, and on the uh, morning announcement, you know, they're always saying, what do we have for lunch? Like I have my little kindergartners and saying, you know, and today's delicious lunch is, you know, roasted zucchini. And, or, you know, they'll say, um, you know, a wellness tip. You know, like make sure that you read the labels on the back of your foods to see what they have in it. So it's just little tiny things like that that you introduce to your kids every single day and it's consistent. So like you were saying, as they grow up or they go home and they talk to their, their parents, they'll go you know, into the refrigerators and they'll look at the label and they'll say, hey mom, what is this? But that's because they learned it in school. So it's not you know, a huge thing, but it's like the little things that kids pick up every day. Um, so I always like to end the events that I run by asking people what your next step is. <laughs> what are you gonna do next with this information? Um, set a goal. We are all each important players and we each have power in our own ways. So if culture is the spoon, as Dr. Katz said, how are you going to feed somebody? Um, and I welcome anyone who's interested to join our network and become a part of this movement locally. So with the school that has the uh, phrase healthy living in its name and with a, non, a, a group who has plant powered in its name, I salute you both. Uh, thank thank you. you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you all for sticking around. You're the stalwarts, we appreciate it. So uh, we're gonna conclude now a few minutes ahead of time. But thank you for coming. I, I think this was a really special and unique event. Very diverse crew came today from all walks of life that have a stake in plant-based health and nutrition and are really going to be the movers and shakers going forward. Uh, I have to really deeply acknowledge Beth Helsner again, our conference chair. She really <laughs> put the proverbial, I don't know, 20 pounds of flesh into this conference. I mean, it really is. For any of you who have organized events like this, you know just, just getting all the parts together um, and getting everything approved by the borough president's office, by downstate, by the state, by this, it's a lot of fun, but I think it was worth it. For me, the big theme today, what came out of this, I think is one word is empowerment. I think we can all be empowered and make change. And like most challenges in life, the solution awaits you at home, in the bathroom, when you look in the mirror. Uh, you know, where uh, I think it was uh, Einstein who said, we cannot solve the main challenges in life at the same level we were at when we first created them. You know, so it's up to us to take control and be empowered. And I think our speaker showed us you can make change. I showed you my personal photos that I've never had up in a meeting before. I mean, we heard the borough president's story, and a few people said to me, was that photoshopped? It was not photoshopped, leave me alone, okay? Um, the borough president gave his story, I think Liana hinted at her story, and uh, there were so many stories, success stories, of people who do this and do it well, and also get their patients and, and their clients and others to uh, to do it. Heck, my son Daniel, who I thought gave a very nice talk, got me to go vegan, got his two brothers to go vegan. We're still working on my wife, we're getting there, but uh, little by little, and we all feel uh, great. Uh, you know, I think we've spent about a year at Downstate pushing this forward, getting the committee going, building our resources, getting the website, doing the conference, and now the pump is primed, I think, to actually make a difference uh, in the community. And we're all fortunate to be at Downstate where we work with people like the Author Ash Center, the Center for Community Health and Wellness. There's uh, Centers for Diversity and Inclusion. There's so many different groups that are out in the community doing things, even student groups. Um, I, I, are you still here, Michelle Wong? Are you, you around somewhere? No, but Downstate just formed a student group called D-I-N-E. 
What is that? It's the Downstate Initiative for Nutritional Empowerment. And uh, I'm, I'm lucky enough to be their faculty advisor. They've had a few meetings. They're doing great. These people are all doing great things. So keep banging the drums and uh, you know, being empowered, empowering others. And we hope to see you at uh, future events, whether it's at the BP's office, whether it's with Plant Powered New York or, uh, or Black Veg Fest or any other thing. Uh, we're honored and privileged that you came. Um, and thank you. Have a wonderful weekend. And fill out your evaluation forms, please. So long, all. <laughs>